All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Have you ever wanted to brew an Oktoberfest-style lager but been thwarted by the fact that it's a lager and you have to use a very specific set of temperatures, that whole notion of things? Well, watch on, and I'm going to show you how to make a very good Oktoberfest beer with lager yeast but at room temperature. If it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome to you. Uh, this channel is all about grain to glass videos where I basically take a beer all the way from start to finish. So I take it from the recipe section through the brewing of the actual beer, through the fermentation, to the very end of the process where I actually taste the final product, and you get to see what happened based on the decisions that I might have made in the recipe or the brewing process and see how that affected the beer, all in one single video for your own convenience. Hopefully this provides you some sort of reference material if you want to make this beer. And as always, I put my recipes in the description box down below for every single beer that I brew. So if you like the way this one turns out in the future, then feel free to check that out for your own reference. I also like to think that I approach these videos from the perspective of what I would consider to be your average home brewer. I don't own very much expensive fancy equipment. I have stuff that's pretty affordable and accessible to most of us. So I kind of just do more with less, if that makes sense. So what we're making today is an Oktoberfest beer uh, as seen from the American perspective. Now the Germans will typically look at Oktoberfest and think Fest beer, which is actually a slightly different type of beer. Uh, but the Americans look at Oktoberfest and they think Märzen. Uh, so as many of you know, Oktoberfest is actually, Oktoberfest kind of comes from the uh, Oktoberfest festival that is thrown in Germany. So the first Oktoberfest took place in 1810 in Munich and it was essentially a giant wedding party for some royalty. Uh, so ever since then it continued as a tradition and the beers that have been consumed are typically either Märzen or Festbier. Uh, Märzen is a slightly more amber copper colored lager, slightly stronger, a little bit maltier than Festbier. Festbier is a slightly easier drinking, slightly lower strength, slightly less amber lager. Uh, in a nutshell. So there are uh, two different things, but I am making a Märzen style beer right now, although not in the true sense because of a couple things. First of all, I'm not making this in March and lagering it all the way through the summer up until October. That is something I just don't feel like doing. Um, and I don't think it's really necessary, although it would make a pretty clean log uh, <laughs> for you know, that long of a lagering period. Right, what I'm going to show you here is how to make an Oktoberfest at a relatively simple level. There's no decoction mashing, there's no step mashing, there's no uh, advanced techniques in this, and there's even no traditional lagering. But I'm going to be using a little bit of a trick to get you a room temperature lager. So the way this is going to work is uh, through a technique known as pressure fermentation. Pressure fermentation is exactly what it sounds like. It's a fermentation with some applied pressure throughout the entire process. This pressure is going to help keep uh, yeast esters and fusel alcohols uh, in check. And what that means is that we can take a regular yeast strain that we would normally ferment kind of cooler and ferment it hotter. Because typically when you ferment hot outside of a yeast temperature range that they're normally fermented in, they will produce nasty flavors, fusel alcohols, things that give you splitting headaches in your beer, and generally just off flavors out the wazoo. Well, this can be solved with pressure fermentation. This is why we're going to take our Saf Lager W3470 Lager Yeast and ferment that thing at 70 degrees room temperature. And we should, by all counts, have a clean beer. Now this is a disclaimer, this is my first time actually making a pressure fermented lager, but I've done a lot of research on it, and it seems like most people out there have had great experiences doing this exact thing. So the pressure fermenter that I'll be using is called a Firmzilla, and it's basically a PET plastic, so a high grade plastic conical fermenter, uh, which can hold up to 35 PSI pressure, which is pretty impressive. That's actually a lot more than some stainless steel competitors. However, one of the best things about this fermenter is the fact that it is literally $120, and I even picked mine up at a discount. So I've been dying to use this in an actual pressurized lager fermentation. I used it in my last brew, which was a New England IPA, and it was fantastic. So uh, I'll leave a link to that video up here, by the way, if you want to check that out. You use the uh, Quake yeast and uh, a whole bunch of very fun tropical hops, and it was a good beer. Um, but anyway, this is going to be our first actual pressurized fermentation. I built a spunding valve for this fermenter very cheaply. It's a very easy thing to do, actually. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different guides online for it. Uh, so I recommend you do that if you're going to follow along for this, uh, but you can also purchase pre-made spunding valves as well, uh, that'll be just as fine. What the spunding valve is going to do is actually allow the CO2 pressure that is generated by the yeast uh, to actually regulate the pressure on the inside of the fermenter and keep it at a steady level. And it, so it basically let out a little bit of gas at a time if the pressure in the fermenter gets too high. So anyway, I think I'm going to go ahead and move along into the recipe here. So uh, this is a pretty classic Oktoberfest style recipe. Seven pounds of Munich malt, that's Munich type one. Uh, four pounds of German Pilsner 
two pounds of Vienna malt, one pound of Cara Munich, and I'm adding half a pound of aromatic malt uh, in there, which is going to kind of simulate some of the flavors that you would get in a decoction mash, uh, which is not what we are doing today. Uh, so for hops, I'm going to be using a single 60-minute bittering edition of 1.3 ounces of pearl. That should get us somewhere between 20 and 24 IBUs, I think. Uh, and my pearl is at 6.2% alpha acids. For yeast, I'm going to be using two packages of the Saf Lager W3470 dry lager yeast. So we're using a water profile that uh, I don't know why, but is very, very, very good at making amber to dark German lagers. And the last three that I have done using this water profile have been outstanding. And I do think a lot of that has to do with the way that this water profile is set up. So that being said, one of the water additions that I'm using is chalk, which is known and actually proven to not really dissolve into water at all, uh, which can sort of throw people off a little bit in terms of their alkalinity. But like I said, I've used this water profile for the last three German beers that I've made and they have all been outstanding. So I really am very hesitant to change anything to do with the water. So that is what it is. Uh, that water profile is starting from my base water, not from reverse osmosis water or distilled water, although you can do that if you want to. Um, but because it's my own city water, there's gonna be a lot higher ion counts. It's gonna be a little bit more minerally than you would expect. Uh, but like I said, just makes kick-ass German beers. So I'm not changing anything. Um, and that water profile is 82 parts per million of calcium, 24 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, and that's actually a pretty important ion uh, in this water profile. Sodium gives a really kind of chewy roundness to German malty lagers that uh, is in the mouthfeel, and I think that's a very, very important addition. Uh, we have 81 parts per million of sulfate, 181 parts per million of chloride, so we're getting that chloride to sulfate ratio at about oh, a little over two to one. Uh, which is important to accentuate the malty characteristic of the beer and then 79 parts per million of bicarbonate So in order to achieve that water profile what I'm adding to my water Which is not going to be probably what you're adding to your water uh, is 8 grams of Epsom 7 grams of calcium chloride and 3 grams of chalk We are going to mash this at about 152 degrees for 90 minutes uh, Which is a bit longer of a rest than I typically do, but I do kind of want to make sure we get a full conversion. So uh, I'm waiting for the rest of my mash water to get heated up, but I have added all those salts and drawn off some sparge water from the whole thing. So we are pretty much ready to dough in once it gets up to temp. So I'll catch you there. Uh, so I built this little do-it-yourself recirculation type system about a year ago now and um, I just use that to kind of maintain a consistent temperature in my mash. I want to stress to you that you really don't need this type of equipment though. Uh, you're going to make great beer just with a standard igloo cooler setup or a brew in the bag setup. You're going to be fine. Uh, I just use this to kind of maintain a little more precision um, but it is really not totally necessary to make this beer style. Okay, so we are now done with our 90 minute mash. Looks like things went pretty well. The color of the wort is looking like a nice kind of dark gold for verging on amber. That's definitely going to darken up quite a bit as we boil this. So I'm getting my sparge water heated up right now. I'm not gonna show this on camera, but what we're gonna do now is just lauder, and that's just draining out that wort from the grain here. I am gonna sparge with about two to three gallons of 170 degree water, uh, which I drew off from my initial mash water, so it has the same water chemistry. Um, so hopefully we're looking for about eight gallons of pre-boil wort and uh, that's what we'll work with for the boil. Okay, so this is the pre-boil gravity. It looks like it's about 11 bricks, which translates to about a gravity about 1043. Uh, a tad low, uh, about four points low, uh, but that's okay because uh, we really kind of don't want to overshoot the 6.2% ABV cap on this style. All right, so we just hit our boil now. It's time to add our 60 minute bittering addition of hops. That is 1.3 ounces of Perla. We're going in now. And that is the only hop addition during the entire brew. So we'll come back with about 10 minutes left in the boil to take care of some additional stuff. Okay, so we're now 10 minutes from the end of the boil. 
So it's important to add a fining agent of some sort for a clean, clear, crisp lager. Uh, so I'm adding in a Whirlflock tablet as well as about two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient, which is just always a good thing to have in any fermentation. So the other thing uh, that is pretty important to do around the 10 minute mark is uh, recirculate boiling hot wort through whatever chilling system you have. In my case, it's a plate chiller uh, for the last 10 minutes of the boil. And then what that's gonna do is ensure that the inside of whatever chilling system you have is uh, actually sanitized. However, that's only gonna sanitize the inside. If you didn't clean the inside and there's like chunks of disgusting mold in there, then you may have a uh, infection problem coming your way later. So make sure that the inside of whatever chilling system you have is clean before you do this. And don't count on this to just clean everything out for you. Okay, so uh, we just finished up our boil now, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and kill off all the heat sources and then we'll start the chilling process. Alright, so if this was a normal lager situation, uh, we would chill this until it was about oh, 45 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, uh, that's not going to happen this time. So because we're fermenting under pressure, uh, we actually only need to bring this down to about room temperature, so your standard ale fermentation uh, pitching temperature, which would be about 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so that is a huge benefit because now I don't have to spend a long time chilling and I don't also have to let it sit in my fridge to get down below what my uh, groundwater temperature is. So that'll be wonderful. All right, so I'm just transferring the cooled wort into the fermenter now. Um, so it's only cooled down to about ale temperatures, but it's okay because we'll be fermenting under pressure and it should really take care of any fusel alcohols or other unwanted sorts of yeast byproducts uh, as a result of fermenting at a very warm temperature. So I'm going to ensure that we aerate the wort by uh, splashing it into the fermenter from a decent height up here. Aeration is pretty important uh, for yeast growth and yeast health. So ensuring that you have a healthy amount of dissolved oxygen, like a couple inches worth of foam on the surface of the wort as you pitch the yeast is generally a good rule of thumb. All right, time to pitch our yeast. That's two packets of Saf Lager W3470. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and start pressurizing the fermenter using just one of my gas lines uh, from my keyser here. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and pressurize the fermenter now. That was the... Uh, Ooh, rookie mistake right there. All right, so now what we're gonna do is pressurize the fermenter. So uh, I have my gas line here from the keyser. So we're gonna go ahead and attach that to the gas side, not the liquid side of, uh, of this setup here. It really goes without saying to ensure that your fermenter has been pressure tested before you actually do this. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and set up my spunding valve here. And uh, these are not exactly built to very accurate standards. So um, the dial that you may get on a pressure relief valve is probably not going to be super accurate. So uh, pressurize your fermenter first and then slowly work on the dial until you actually see an appropriate uh, fermentation pressure here. All right, so we're pressurizing this to about five PSI right now. Uh, we're gonna start off low and then we'll slowly increase the pressure over the course of the fermentation. Right, so that way we don't completely inhibit the ester production because we do want a little bit of yeast character here. So what I've done is I've actually pressurized my fermenter to about 15 PSI. And we're gonna go ahead and work on the uh, pressure relief valve here on the spunding valve that I made until we get down to about five PSI. All right, seems like it's about good enough. All right, well, that seems like it's down to about five or six PSI, so we'll leave it there for the first bit of fermentation. And then uh, as fermentation continues, I will slowly increase the pressure, and that's just gonna ensure that we don't get any sort of oxidation or any oxygen input into the fermenter. And um, the yeast, as it ferments, will actively create CO2, which will create pressure, which is why we have that spunding valve on there. It's really important that you don't just plug the fermenter up because otherwise it's just gonna carbonate itself real fast. I'm not actually trying to use this as a unit tank and actually carbonate in the same vessel as fermentation. 
um, but it will give me the benefit, however, of a decreased fermentation time. I'll go ahead and put this in a dark corner and uh, then I'll talk about fermentation with you in a second here. Okay, so the brew day went pretty well, all things considered. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I didn't do it traditionally. I didn't do a decoction mash or a step mash or anything, you know. So if you incorporate those types of things into your brew, you're going to have a little bit more of an intense brew day. But um, all things considered, this was actually a pretty hands-off one, which was kind of nice. So anyway, fermentation for this one. So specifically, if you're pressure fermenting, uh, you're going to keep it at 5 PSI for about... Now a week or so. It depends on how fast that yeast really chews through things. Uh, but towards the latter half of the fermentation, you kind of want to increase the pressure just a little bit. Um, and this is going to keep oxygen out of there. And uh, it's going to start to actually carbonate your beer a little bit. So you will have a little tiny bit of carbonation in there if you do this correctly. However, there is one thing I do want to uh, mention really quickly, and that is the fact that I'm using the Saflager W3470 yeast. Um, that is actually notorious for producing uh, good, clean lager flavors at room temperature. So regardless of whether or not you're using pressure, you could theoretically ferment any lager at around 60 to 70 degrees with this yeast and have good results. Um, there is plenty of documentation on the internet about this type of thing. So if you don't have a pressure fermenter, uh, you could theoretically make a Mocktoberfest by using W3470 yeast and fermenting it at room temperature, and you actually might get away with some pretty good results. I've never done this myself. However, like I said, there's a ton of evidence out there on the internet of people doing this successfully. So um, fear not if you don't have pressure fermentation system. So anywhere from, I'd say, 7 to 10 days, but it could really ferment out a lot faster than that. Like I said, my first time actually pressure fermenting, so we'll see what it does. Either way, once it's completed the fermentation process, the next thing we're going to do is transfer over to a keg or other type of serving container. Uh, so one thing that you can do to really speed up the clarifying process is adding gelatin finings or any other sort of uh, fining agent to the beer once it's ready to go. That's going to help drop yeast out of the solution. It's also going to help drop proteins out sometimes. So uh, in, I highly encourage you to do that if you're really kind of rushing to get this ready. But either way, if you don't have the ability to do that, just a good old cold crash and some cold storage time is going to do you wonders. I'm hoping to have this video published sometime by the end of August, I would hope, or maybe early September at the latest. And that hopefully will give you guys enough time to actually create Oktoberfests of your own in time for October. So I wish you the best of luck. Okay, so here is our OG. It looks like it's about 14 bricks. And that equates to about 1056 for an original gravity, which is basically right on target. Uh, that should give us a beer somewhere between 5 and 6%. So... Looking forward to how this goes. So after degassing the final gravity sample, it looks like we're at about 1014 for final gravity, so just on the edge of the acceptable range. All right, so the part everybody's been waiting for. Uh, as you saw, it fermented up pretty decently. It actually was completed fermentation, hit the final gravity in all of three days. Uh, so this yeast absolutely tore through things even faster than a quike did. Uh, which is kind of surprising to me, but it does kind of have a reputation for being a pretty aggressive fermenter at warm temperatures. So I was pleasantly surprised to see that happen. Having a final gravity of 1014, however, uh, I was not super pleasantly surprised to see. Um, I was kind of hoping for something a little bit lower, about 1012 or 1010 even, because number one, we want this to be a highly drinkable beer. And number two, if it had gotten a little bit further past 1014, I would have hit that minimum standard in percent ABV that the BJCP says uh, is acceptable for a Mertzen. So this ended up being 5.6%, uh, and the BJCP wants 5.8%, um, which is really frustrating that I missed that by 0.2%. Uh, I'm still calling it an Oktoberfest because that's what I intended to make, and I think it's good, and I think it'll serve that purpose. I really don't see that many people nitpicking over 0.2%, um, but uh, have at me if that's an issue for you. But in all seriousness, if you do want to get that 5.8%, just up the original gravity a little bit. So, like most German beers, uh, glassware is important. This is a Hofbrau mug that I love, uh, and I will be using for this Oktoberfest, so let's go ahead and pour it. Okay, so it's called Crashing King Ludwig's Wedding, and it comes in at 5.6% ABV and 22 IBUs. All right, for the appearance of the beer, uh, it is a really nice kind of light copper color. Uh, initially, I thought it was a little too pale when it came out, but I think I actually nailed the color. Uh, it is 100% clear, totally bright. So there is a lot of humidity out today, though, uh, so there might be some condensation forming on the glass. 
It has a really nice kind of off-white head. It's not too heavily carbonated and it does have very good head retention. As you'll see, there's a fine layer that uh, keeps itself on the beer as you drink it. So now we'll move on towards aroma. Oh yeah, so the aroma is really nice. Kind of get this like toasted caramel and honey biscuit kind of aroma. Um, yeah, it's all nice sweet malt kind of uh, character. A little bit of minerality as well. But, um, you know, it's not too strong of an aroma, uh, but it's mostly dominated by those malt flavors. All right, moving in towards mouthfeel. So despite having a relatively high final gravity, this beer maintains a nice solid medium mouthfeel. Uh, not too light, not too heavy. Uh, it really is quite drinkable, I think. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's not, so, it's not super heavy, not like a strong Maybach, for example. Um, which would have a heavier alcohol presence and a little bit more of a, uh, a thicker body, and this one does not have that. Carbonation level is nice and light. Um, it's definitely there, but it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't get in the way, it doesn't overdo it, um, and it doesn't uh, sting your tongue at all. It's, uh, it's quite a good level of carbonation, I think. All right, so now moving on to flavor. It's pretty good, it's very refreshing. Um, so the flavor is uh, mostly dominated by Munich and Vienna malts. Um, I was honestly expecting a little more caramel presence in this, um, but that's okay. The vast majority of this is bready and um, kind of bread crusty, I guess. You know, So you get a lot of character from the Munich and Vienna malts, which are bready and doughy and, and sort of their, uh, and chewy you know, in, in their flavor profiles. Um, there is some underlying toasted caramel, but not as much as I would have liked. There's no fruitiness. Um, there is a subtle essence of minerality, I think. Um, that water profile is rather minerally, so <laughs> not, not surprising in that department. So I think there's a good balance struck here between the maltiness and the bitterness of the hops. Um, an Oktoberfest is a style that can be very easily tipped in one direction or the other. You can have, you can very easily have an Oktoberfest that is way too sweet and unbalanced, as well as one that's way too bitter and, and you know, not, not malty at all. Uh, if you put, if, you know, and you'll notice I didn't add anything at the 10 minute mark, and there's a reason for that. It's very, very easy to tip that balance over into the too hoppy of an Oktoberfest spectrum, in which case it is not a quaffable beer. And uh, it makes it a little more difficult to take these, you know, liter by liter. Uh, <laughs> overall, I think this was a pretty good success. I mean, it was done fermenting in three days, uh, which was very fast. Then I was away from home for a while. I had to leave it in the primary fermenter for about two weeks, uh, which really didn't matter. Uh, I took that final gravity, I took a reading at 10.14 um, on the day that I left, and then I came back, and it was still 10.14, so... <laughs> Uh, it didn't really do much but sit in the fermenter for two weeks. Um, but then I kegged it, added some gelatin, and uh, that dropped it out real quick. It got very bright, very fast. I also got a floating dip tube system set up in my keg when I put this in. So basically the dip tube is drawing beer from the top instead of from the bottom, where all the yeast and shrub and stuff that settles out of the beer, uh, especially from your gelatin, uh, will end up. So basically we are four days from when I kegged it. So in theory, this beer could be done in a week. As you can see, everything has dropped out completely and it's very, very clear, very bright. Uh, so it does tick all those boxes. So definitely the pressure fermentation method or the warm fermentation in the case of the W3470 yeast uh, works very well in this case. So while the method that I use does have some merits, I think it also has some drawbacks that uh, may have influenced how this beer is tasting. I'd say my single biggest criticism of this beer right now is that it is just not interesting enough for me. It is really more of an amber ale to me in flavor than an Oktoberfest. And honestly, that could be due to a number of different factors. First of all, I could just up the percentage of Karamunic malt in the grain bill to kind of give it a little more of that kind of German caramel kick. Uh, I think that would be one thing, but I think the other thing is the fact that I fermented it under pressure suppressed the yeast ester quite a bit. And anyone who's had a good true lager knows that uh, yeast character from lager yeast is kind of distinct. Uh, there's a little bit of a sulfur bite, and there's a little bit of minerality that comes out of that in a way uh, that really makes the beer seem crisp and just kind of authentically German. And I think I actually might have put a little too much initial pressure 
you know, the fermenter. It, it read 5 PSI, but like I said, those spunding valves aren't necessarily built to a great degree of accuracy. It could have been anywhere plus or minus 3 PSI from 5, I think. So uh, I think what happened here is the yeast were a little too suppressed and they didn't express themselves as much as they could have. And I think that resulted in a slightly less interesting beer at the end of the day from lack of character that yeast could have otherwise provided. Uh, that being said, this is extremely clean. Uh, <laughs> on the flip side, there is no yeast expression whatsoever. So um, if you're looking for a very clean way to ferment beer, this might be it. I mean, it's not a bland beer. Um, I just think it's missing some elements that I would have otherwise wanted to see. On the flip side, this is also a very young lager. Anyone who's also traditionally done a lager and aged it for a long period of time in either a keg or bottles knows that uh, over a long period of time that lager flavor will kind of continue to develop and evolve and uh, become more interesting over time. This type of beer ages very, very well. And uh, it's also possible that a good part of the lack of interesting flavor that I'm getting is, uh, is due to the fact that it's just very young. Uh, normally, young lagers have so much sulfur in them, they're very difficult to drink. Um, but this is not the case. And, you know, I think uh, this being only a week or so old might have a little bit to do with that flavor impact. But really, overall, at the end of the day, I think it's a good beer. It's very easy to make, um, and it's reliably a crowd pleaser. So a growler of this has already gone out to a couple friends of mine, and uh, they have very much enjoyed it. So I got some good feedback on that. It's just not totally up to my own personal standards, I think. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm probably going to give this a good rating of about seven and a half to eight, I think. It was a good beer. It went very well. Um, it is probably only going to continue to improve. And I'm pretty happy with the way that it turned out. Um, I just wish it could have been a little bit more. And there's a couple things that could have been improved upon. However, if you are looking to make an Oktoberfest in time for October this year, this is definitely a good method for you to try out, and I think it'll make a pretty good beer for you. Would I submit this to a competition? Probably not. That being said, it would probably make a pretty good Vienna lager. Um, I just think it's lacking that kind of caramel uh, rosiness and backbone uh, that you would expect from a Meritzen style lager. This was extremely easy to make, so there's no reason I can't just go back and do it again. I think I just might because this is a very drinkable beer and it's going away very quickly. So if you decide that you want to make the beer for yourself in the way that I made it, there is a complete recipe in the description box down below. Just check that out if you want to write it down. Thank you for watching. Please hit that like button before you go. It's really important to me and my channel. But if you like the stuff on the regular, please hit that subscribe button. Every two to three weeks, I will kick out a new grain of glass video to the best of my brewing abilities. And I will give you guys every single dirty detail of the process. And you'll get to see how my brews go and possibly make them for yourself. Every single beer that I make has the recipe included and I don't shy away from showing you details of things that got screwed up. If two to three weeks for a new video is a little too long, please feel free to follow me on Instagram. It is at the apartment brewer on Instagram and there I will post roughly every two to three days and you get to see what's going on in real time in my brewing life. So you get a good preview of things that'll come to the channel eventually. Hit up the comment section too if you want to discuss any aspect of this beer. I do love talking to everybody. I read every single comment and I do my best to uh, respond to as many of them as I can in a timely manner. So also in the description box down below the recipe, there's a complete list of all of my homebrewing equipment uh, that I use to make beer with as of this video and links to Amazon or other stores where you can purchase it for yourself if you're in the market for it. And that also includes the Firmzilla that I used to ferment this lager with in this video. Just be advised that if you do click on some of those links, not all of them, but some of them, uh, and you do purchase something through them, I do earn a very small commission, but it is at no additional cost to you, and it goes right back into support of this channel. So I do thank you for your purchase if you do choose to do that. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish off what little is left of this beer, and I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers. Cheers.